we see rapes, we see dowry debts, we see suicides, we see maternal mortality and whatnot. On the other side, we also see positives like women achieving great heights. India is proud to have the Miss Universe 2021 from India. And I would like to say and begin my session with the words she has given us. If you believe in yourself and you march forward, nothing would stop you. Well, yes, ladies, before that, before going on to the PPT, I would again want to ask you another question for which I would want answers through polls. That is, you can comment and comment. You can post your comment here. The um, question is this. Do you think that rapists deserve death penalty? People who rape, do they deserve death penalty? Or should we allow them to live? Is the question clear to you? Ma'am, there are some responses. Uh, can you see okay. the, the screen here for me is stuck? I don't know. There is some technical problem, so I cannot see it. Ma'am, press all to anyway, tap. Yes, most of you would have said that yes, they deserve death penalty. Is it? Could somebody help me? with what was the majority of the polls? Ma'am, I'll read out for you, ma'am. Yeah. Um, not death, but emasculation. That is emasculation, okay. Okay, another uh, participant is asking to repeat the question, ma'am. Okay, the question is this. See, there are so many rapists out there who rape women. So do you think that we should kill or we should give capital punishment, death penalty for those rapists, directly death penalty. No other punishment is, lesser punishment is permissible, only death penalty. Do you think that only death should be given? That is the question. Okay, another participant is saying uh, not death, but it should be more severe living. Okay. And uh, one more, uh, a strong punishment provision should be there. Okay. Okay, anyway, thank you guys for your valuable comments and recommendations. Well, yes, we have a lot of laws. That is what I'm going to tell you. We have a lot of laws for women, but the laws have a lot of lacunies. Why are there so many offenses against women despite there being so many laws there are so many laws in this country but why are there so many why are there so many offenses against women one of the reason is lack of awareness especially educated people of the society the most highly educated women i can say in the country you guys who are seated here the last session for you was an insight into many new dimensions of arena that you were not aware of so if people like us are not aware of the law people like us are not sensitized then definitely what about those millions out there who have no access to education, who are subjects of patriarchy. So basically, my dear friends, I would like to, uh, it's a personal request that those of you who have attended this session, whatever little you have gained from last class and this session, please ensure that you use it in your day-to-day -day life and you try to help somebody who is in need, some women who can be empowered. Well, 
I'm coming on to many important judgments which have turned the plight of Indian women. Last day, you would have heard about Advocate Reggie speaking about Mathura rape case, the Nirbhaya rape case, etc. Now, there has been several judgments that is where there has not been a law, there has been international conventions, covenants, etc., which has been implemented in India through case laws. So only after that, see, Parliament has to sit together, Parliament has to make law, and uh, you say the President has to sign it, then only every law comes out. But in emergency situations where there is no law, judges make the law. So like that, if you remember, Advocate Reggie has been talking about a lot of case laws the other day, like Vishaka guidelines, which has turned out to be great laws later, which has been enacted into legislation. Now, I'm going to talk to you about few case laws which has turned the plight of Indian women. Air India versus Nargish Misra. This is a case where uh, basically if you want to be an aerostress, you have to give a written agreement that you will not marry and if you marry, you will not get pregnant. In case you get pregnant, you will be terminated from your job. So Air India versus Nargish Misra was a case wherein this very patriarchal system was challenged and held to be unconstitutional. Coming on to another case, is the second slide visible? Uh, Ma'am, there is an overlap uh, on top of it. Yes, again here, Indian Foreign Service. She was uh, working in the Indian Foreign Service and the condition was like, if you get married, you would be terminated. Now, this has been discriminatory towards women and it has been held to be unconstitutional. That is what you mean by unconstitutional against the constitutional morality or against the very principles, very fundamental rights, against the very core dynamas which have been given in the constitution. Gaurav Jain versus Union of India. Now, prostitution. We all see prostitutes as something very inferior or something very wrong. But my dear friends, they do that for making a living. They might have a young one to support. They might be having an aging parent to care for. So prostitution cannot be punished. Now, if you know, there is an Immoral Traffic Prevention Act. Earlier, prostitution was like, you know, considered to be an offense. But under this act, it is not the prostitute who is punished, but the pimp. There will always be a broker. If you look into movies and all those things, there will always be a broker who arranges for this women who will always be standing as a middleman, basically. So it is the middleman who is punished. And in Gaurav Jain, the Supreme Court said that instead, like, Prostitutes should not be punished. In fact, they should be given education and training. Also, their children should be uplifted. That was the saying of the Supreme Court. Now, state of Tamil Nadu versus Suhas Kati. Now, we all are very active in social media. Like we uh, post messages or we post our views on uh, social media. But we post our photos on social media, but there are so many people who uh, just stalk you. Now, the other day, I guess, Advocate Ravi, uh, Renji has given you an insight on stalking. Stalking is basically somebody who keeps coming behind you personally or uh, trying to interact with you or trying to create communication. Anybody who keeps constantly uh, following you or harassing you on social media also would come under this provision of stalking. So somebody was talking, somebody here, there was uh, a person deliberately, delib deliberately posted the phone number of this lady online in some phone site and she was harassed. So here under IT Act, this was the first case of the, after the Information Technology Act 2000 coming up. 
this was the first case also which which was registered under that so here in this case state of tamil nadu was a suhas karthi she was granted justice by the honorable high court against this man who posted vulgar things against her now randeer singh was his union of india this is one of the very important case which said that there should be equal pay for equal work you see men and women doing the same kind of work but women are paid lesser why so so for the same kind of work for the same time of work for the same effort there should be equality in remuneration that was what was just enumerated in this judgment so chitta srivastava versus chandigarh administration now you will be thinking what is the need for us to learn all these case laws it is not the case laws or the names but it is the different concepts which come up or the different rights that women have which i am trying to enunciate here so chitra srivastava versus chandigarh administration now whether to carry forward your pregnancy or whether to terminate it whether to have children whether to not have children uh, to decide the timing space of your children etc is a female's autonomy unfortunately in india we do not recognize that the moment you finish your education or you start your college people will start asking you when you getting married when you getting married the moment you get married the next question would be oh when you are not having a baby when will you have a baby the moment you have a baby the next question will be like when are you going to have your second baby there will be so much compulsion from the family from outside world etc to to get a child now my dears to have a child now suppose uh, the husband doesn't want a child and the wife wants a child the right of the wife to have a child should be respected it is her personal autonomy and things cannot be imposed upon her similarly to have the number of how many number of children if she doesn't want to have children or maybe she wants one child you cannot insist her or compel her to have more children but unfortunately that is not the plight in india i just wanted to uh, let you know that you if you you always have the right to deny but definitely to keep the family bonds going or to keep the institution of uh, family on always women have a tendency to give like to be the person who gives into the likings of others and maybe she will have to compromise her career her future her dreams etc just for the sake of begetting children so when to beget how much to be get the number and spacing etc is all totally a discretion should be a discretion of a women now she can refuse to have sex if she does not she is not interested all that comes under the sexual autonomy of a person and it will automatically come under right to life under the indian constitution yes now when we say about reproductive rights i would just like to say about the reproductive rights that are available to women maternal help now if i don't know there is a place called atapadi in coimbatore border it's border to kerala and tamil nadu if i don't know if you have seen in the national newspapers uh you would always find cases of infant mortality you would find cases of maternal mortality on a very high scale especially among the tribals this is a tribal place the reason for that is early marriages lack of proper nutrition no gap between two pregnancies then definitely lack of knowledge lack of awareness and exploitation no adequate infrastructure so maternal health is very important especially that spacing of children the uh, nutrient she gets also when we speak about maternal health i would also like to say about not just the uh, the physical part of it but the part of postpartum depression not many not many in our society uh, acknowledge this part so you can see mothers uh, very new mothers going into depression you can see them committing suicide 
who is responsible for all this? It is just you and me. When we talk to elders, or maybe when you tell your problem to elders, the general attitude that society has is like, oh, you are not the first one who to deliver. You would be, we also have delivered. So postpartum depression is also one serious thing to see. And if you see uh, the re causes of maternal mortality or the high increasing rates of women's death in the country, maternal mortality is one among them. Women dying during giving birth or maybe like uh, just few months within giving birth. So my dear friends, if you have a friend who has undergone her delivery or things like that, kindly be empathetic and give her your helping hand. Also, give your insights to the very public you know about all these things that you learn here today. Now, access to contraceptive. Access to contraceptive, now we know about condoms. There are many other contraceptive measures which men can resort to, men, which women can resort to. Unfortunately, it's a shame for us to go and be asking in the medical store. It is a shame for us to talk about such things to our family, to our friends, and we suppress all these things. No. For sterilization, if you take a look into sterilization campaigns in North India, you can see that it is not the men, but the women who are forced to sterilization. That is to stop your reproductive capacity permanently. It is not just as I'm talking about temporary sterilization, but permanent sterilization. Wherein men can also do that, women are compelled post pregnancies now all these will come under reproductive health challenges in the country which need to be addressed for which there are laws but definitely the laws are not being keen into or the women do not challenge these things because they are institutionalized in marriage or they are suppressed in marriage or maybe because of ignorance indian Young Lawyers Association versus State of Kerala. This is a case of you all would have heard about Shabrimala case, wherein women menstruating women of menstruating age was allowed to enter the Shabrimala temple. Now this is something which was very much debatable in the country. A lot of debates happened whether we should allow menstruating women to enter the temple or not. There was a lot of moral ethical and a lot of you know religious things which is considered on one side and on the other side women's right will women's right develop so much that a menstruating women can enter the temple that is the question yes but anyway the honorable supreme court has affirmed that um, women of menstruating age can enter the temple she is, I mean, this is a uh, this temple is specifically of Lord Ayyappa. Joseph Shine versus Union of India. Now, my dear guys, adultery. You know what is adultery, right? I don't need to be telling you what is adultery. Yes, earlier adultery was an offense. It was in Joseph Shine versus Union of India. It was decriminalized. That is, it is no longer an offense. Anybody can go with anybody and live. It is not an office. Now, why do I have to tell this to you? It's because earlier, this particular law used to punish the man. Suppose now I am having a adulterous relationship with a man. Only my husband could file a case against the other man. And here there would no, not be any legal action against me saying that women is weak, she is feeble. So basically what the court said here is like, adultery is no longer an offense. Live-in relationships are permitted today in this country. Anybody can live with anybody. You can have any kind of relationship with anybody. That is all up to you. But this particular thing, this adultery is no longer an offense because that particular section, that is 497 of IPC, basically sees women as an object or she is something inferior to man. 
that is one of the reasons why this Joseph Shine versus Union of India judgment is there. So basically, you see in movies, like see, there is a raid. Uh, two people are in a lodge or in a hotel, and police comes and takes them out, and all those things. That is all not in today's age, because anybody can go and you can have any kind of relationship with anybody. That is the scenario now. So I am not uh, like I'm not encouraging you for those things, but yes, you should be knowing it. Now, Indian Army, you you would have recently heard that uh, Babita Punaya, whether women could come into uh, commanding roles in the military. Yes, this was the judgment. Secretary Military of Defense versus Babita Punaya and others, where the glass ceiling of the Indian Army was broken and a woman was given a commanding position in the Indian Army. It is a proud moment indeed. Yes. Equal rights of daughters in co personally property. Now we would be looking into that in our forthcoming slides when we say about right to property of women. Basically, for the first time, women have equal right in co personally property. That was said in Vineet Sharma versus Rakesh Sharma. I would be explaining this in detail, so I'm not emphasizing on that wrong. Prostitution is not an offense. Adult women has right to choose a vocation. Kajal Mukesh versus state. Nalsa versus Union of India. Now, my dear guys, when I say this, I would uh, also want to say, when I say about women, I would also want not want to miss out the trans women as well. The transgenders who identify themselves as women. We should also be recognizing them. So National Legal Service Authority versus Union of India is a 2014 judgment which said like uh, the third gender identity should be given to Hijra's Unix also. And also like uh, if they want to, they should be identified by the gender they call themselves. To. If a third gender person says I am a woman, I would like to be called as a woman. You should respect that identity. So Nalsa versus Union of India is very important from the point of view of trans women. Now, Navjot Singh Johar versus Union of India. Now, when it, when you say about you have a lot of lesbians there. Now, people would directly would not want to talk about lesbians or gay. Or maybe they would not want to open up even if they have a sexual inclination towards the same sex. Women's right in the country has progressed to the extent that if you have a same sex relationship, you are free to follow it. And it is no longer unconstitutional in the country. Yes, section 377 of Indian Penal Code. Now, earlier, if you go against nature, that is uh, basically oral sex and uh, sex against nature, having sex with animals, all these things come under section 377. Now, like uh, same sex also, I mean, if you had a same sex sexual relationship also, it would come under this. But now, to the extent of two consulting adults of the same sex also, if you indulge in a sexual activity in private, excuse me, private. So in your private space, if you engage in a sexual activity, it is no longer an offense. So women marrying women, women engaging in a sexual activity with a woman is no longer a offense. So basically sexual orientation here is protected in this case. Now, when I come next is, so uh, I gave you, see, there are a lot of cases which come forward. So I just wanted to give you an idea into some of the key areas. See, now the less talked upon is reproductive health or say uh, your identity to, or your choice to have a relationship with the same sex person, etc. So what is encouraged here is not to have a relationship. This is all okay. So I can go, not that. But yes, your sexual orientation or your individuality. A person loving somebody of the same sex, that should not be taken 
in a negative sense, but that is the first, basically the orientation of this person. And that has to be acknowledged by society and not discriminated against. So it has to be taken in a very positive sense. When it comes to uh, accuse, suppose now we all are people in our day to day life. Uh, we may come across some police case and if some police case happens, how do we address it? Or maybe like in our neighborhood, there will be somebody whom we can help some women who we can help. Yes, right to know the grounds of arrest. Basically, when the police comes to arrest you, you have the right to know that. On what grounds in uh, what did I do? What are the grounds? Why am I arrested? All these things you have the right to know. So in Article 22, Clause 1, this is the Indian Constitution. Here also giving the reason or the ground for the arrest or detainment is very essential. Section 650 of the Criminal Procedure Code. Now I'm talking about different acts. You will be confused. See, Indian Penal Code is the law which gives an idea of offense. Suppose now I kill, kill, I kill you with a knife, it come, becomes murder. So to become murder, what are all things are necessary, etc. Now this Criminal Procedure Code is the procedure which says about when you are arrested, what are your rights? Uh, what is the duty of the police? What is the duty of the court, etc.? The procedure in criminal cases is basically dealt in criminal procedure code. Fine. Yes. So now section 50 also says that the relevant grounds of your arrest should be known. So some, some police comes and cats, snatches you and goes without telling you why they are taking you. No. It is a violation of your human rights, basically. The moment they arrest you, before they arrest you, they should tell you the grounds of your arrest. Yes, even if it's a junior person or a junior police who is arresting, you have the right to know the grounds of your arrest. Similarly, if it's a case which needs warrant, you should, they should also let you know the grounds for, or they, they should show you the warrant before they arrest you. Give me a second. Yes. Now, when it comes to women, women cannot be arrested after sunset and before sunrise. That is, say, during the night, the women cannot be arrested in normal circumstances. It is your right that you should not be arrested during the night time, after sunset and before sunrise. If they have to arrest you in serious circumstances, then the police need to get the permission of the first class judicial magistrate. Only within, with the permission, special permission, can a woman be arrested during the night. Similarly, if to question you, if you are, if you are a, vic a witness or if you are a victim, or if you're given a complaint, or maybe somebody has given a complaint against you, etc., to question you, they should always come to the safety of your walls or the place where you are comfortable with. And in the presence of a lady police officer, it is very important, lady police officer. Yes. Now, suppose the police comes to your house and they start searching. They have a warrant to search your house or they search for somebody, some accused, etc. in your house. And if this in that house, there is some, see now, people from different community, for example, uh, you have Pardanishan women, those, especially in North India, where the uh, women from a particular Muslim sect, they do not come out, they do not mingle with society, they are totally just that only the husband sees their face. It's not like the people who just wear parda and go. It's not that Muslims who wear parda, not just that, but a little bit more orthodox kind of people. Or maybe even amongst us, there will be Hindu or Christians, etc. traditions that people will not come out when men come out, etc. So if you have some such kind of a custom and the police comes to search your house, then definitely uh, you can intimate it and they can cancel the search. 
or they can give you reasonable time to move away from the place so that they can search. Okay. The next one is to search a woman. Now we have seen, right, when you enter malls or where there are security persons, when you go to the airport for check-in, there is always a police officer who will be searching you. So for women, the search procedure can only be done by women. Men cannot raise your hand. Similarly, is the case of arrest. To arrest you, there should be a women police officer. Men do not have the right to touch your body for the sake of arrest or for the sake of search, whichever police official that person is. So, similarly, again, um, uh, when medical examination is being done, suppose uh, now uh, the accused would be medically examined, when in prison also they have regular health checkups. Similarly, uh, the accused now in certain offenses, the accused now say, this is a general neutral of section. So for men, suppose they committed a uh, rape and they go to the hospital, they will be uh, medically examined to check the presence of uh, semen or something like that, some clue or blood stains, etc. from the private organ, etc. to ascertain it is rape. Similarly, for women also, when the women uh, victim, that is when I speak about the victim, I will be saying that as even as an offender or even as an accused, when you are, if you are in prison, you will be having medical checkups. That will, that should be done only by a female medical practitioner. It is very important. Please note. Yes. Now you are arrested and within 24 hours, you should be produced before the magistrate. They take you to the police station. They keep you there for three days without uh, filing, uh, writing the case, without telling you what you did, uh, without telling you whether you'll get bail. No. The moment they arrest you, from then 24 hours on, you should be produced before the magistrate, the nearest magistrate. That is set in Article 22, Clause 2 of the Indian Constitution. <clears throat> now, if he's taken a warrant, arrest warrant, that is different. Without a warrant, if you have arrested a person, you have to produce a person before 24, within 24 hours before the nearest police office, uh, I mean, nearest court, magistrate. So all these things are uh, again repeated in all these provisions. It's a replica of the earlier provisions. Now, uh, if suppose now this 24 hours means excluding the time of travel. That means you have to be calculative when you will reach there. Within 24 hours of arrest, the person has to be produced before the court. Now, right to be released on bail. Now, the, for different kind of offenses, if you are done a lesser offense, you will get a bail from the police station. You, for serious offenses, you will get a bail from the court. The police has to give you information whether you can avail bail, what are the conditions for your bail. Basically, bail will be granted. There are two kinds of offenses. For less less serious offenses, uh, usually bail is a right. But for serious offenses like, say, murder or um, you did a very grievous crime, uh, more, like you say, rape and uh, continuous rapes and all those things, such kind of things, when you are pro, uh, you will not necessarily, you should get bail. Bail is not a right there. Bail is a discretion of the court. So there are different scenario where you will get bail. Normally you will get bail. Uh, bail is usually of three types. One is the ordinary bail. It is after you're arrested, you can uh, try for bail. The second is anticipatory bail. Anticipatory bail means anticipating. You think you will be arrested for such a thing, you can go and get an anticipatory bail from the high court. Now, the next is transit bail. Suppose you are in Tamil Nadu and you think the Kerala police will arrest you for an offense done in Kerala. 
you can take a bale from Tamil Nadu that is known as transit bale. I'm not going into detail for all these things, but just for you to know that bail, yes, bail is a right for less serious offenses. Right to fair and just trial. Yes, when you say fair and just trial, there are certain principles that is here the other side. If you are arrested, your version should also be heard. Now we see court, like we see the courtroom in many movies or say TV programs, etc. What happens then? Over there, you will see that the accused will be put in a cage or he will be made to stand separately and the accused lawyer and the government lawyer, etc. will be talking, uh, will be uh, discussing the cases. So what I was saying is like the accused should be given a chance to represent herself. Her version of the story need be said. Whatever she has to say has to be recorded in the court. Can you hear me? I, I, I came. I was having work. Right to consult a lawyer. Now, every person, from the moment you are arrested, you have the right to consult a lawyer. You can choose which lawyer should defend you, not necessary that the police should say, you call this, only this lawyer, eh? you call this lawyer, then only you will go. It is your discretion, which lawyer to choose uh, to defend your case. During interrogation, when you are questioned, during those times also, you have the uh, right to consult with your lawyer to take legal opinion, etc. In criminal proceedings also, in cases also, criminal case, which I've already begun, you have the right to consult a lawyer. Now, please note, if you are accused and you do not have money to keep a lawyer, you can contact the legal service authority. There will always be a legal service authority in every district. So you can go to this legal service authority and say, I am indigent. I mean, basically, I do not have the money for consent. I would like to have a legal support. So they will designate a lawyer to help you, for which you needn't pay. The legal service authority will pay. Now, this is uh with regard to people who cannot afford yes right to free legal aid that is in article 39a of the constitution free legal aid now uh, usually such classes that let's see for example we are giving we are giving as a part of a seminar but usually most of the institutions they conduct legal aid or legal awareness programs so that is also a right of the accused the accused can know about the various rights uh, available. The legal aid is also a right for the accused. Like you should know the provisions, the possibilities, etc. So this is one of the important cases, Katri versus Bihar, where legal aid is a, a part of right to life, it was said, of the prisoner. Right to keep quiet. Now, this is very important. You are not needed to give evidence about against yourself. Now, if you see, now if you see very interestingly in movies, you can see, uh, suppose a murder case. Now, I'm giving you an incident of murder as example. It is not you are going to commit murder, but it's interesting to say, or it's just an example. So, such is a case, or that is an example for every other smaller offenses also. Now, I'm not saying that you need be arrested, but anyone who is arrested around, you can definitely tell them these are your rights. I pray that you are never arrested. Yes. So now, suppose it's a murder case. And uh, the you look in the TV, right? The, say, suppose a murderer killed somebody and threw the knife in a pond. So in the movie, they will show like the murderer will come with the police and the murderer will show. There, there, I, I threw the knife there. And the police will take the knife out of the water or well or wherever 
dug it, digging it wherever if it is uh, dug and kept in the earth or in the ground, etc. Now, what is this? When you are taken to the police station, excuse me, listen. When you are taken to the police station and you are asked whether you did it, you see that third degree measures taken. They will be hitting you, hammering you, and finally you accept. Sometimes you will accept things you even didn't do. Oh, madam, oh, sir, please, please don't hurt me. Um, I, I, I agree. I did all these things, even though you would not have done it. So the confessions that you make to police are not acceptable in court of law. Then what is this? That police takes this knife. You police only thinks that, say, suppose now you uh, you showed the knife. So you needn't speak that, sir, I killed him. I killed him with a knife. When you say this, police cannot take the fact that you killed him. But the fact that you killed him with a knife is important. So that is the reason why police goes and they find out the evidence against you. So even if you, they find this knife, etc., and the case comes to court, and in court, the police will ask you, did the police, uh, I mean, the court will ask you, the judge will ask you, or maybe the public prosecutor will ask you, were you harassed in the police station? Even for less offenses, when you are produced before the magistrate, the question that the police, uh, that the magistrate will ask you is, are you okay? Were you harassed by the police? So the right not to be harassed by the police is there. And normally, the reason why every statement you tell the police is not acceptable against you in court of law is because of the fact that police will resort to third degree measures to make you confess. So whatever you confess need not be voluntary. You would have told all that out of fear. So that is the reason why police will talk to you and you will say, yes, sir, I did it and all those things. That statement what you said that I did it is not relevant in court of law. But police is asking you that just to get more and more evidence to say, show that you did it. Did you, is that, I don't know if that point is clear. Is that clear? So whatever you tell to the, admit to the police, you confess to the police, cannot be taken against you. That is one relevant point. But only they can, see, they can collect based um, on your statement. Yes. Based on your statement, I they can know. collect. Pardon? So what I was telling is like the police usually to if they get a criminal or if they get a person who is accused of a crime, they will uh, usually try to have beat you or try to hit you or try to hammer you or try to put unnecessary allegations on you to prove the case. So you may you may say yes, yes, yes. You may agree with the fact that you did the offense even if you did not do the offense because you are scared of. How, you know, you're scared of them. You're scared they will kill you or you're scared that something bad will happen to you. Scared that uh, they will harass you or they will harass your family, whatever. So whatever statements you give against yourself, the fact that I killed him is not admissible or it's not considered in the court. But police usually will talk to you and will uh, intro in, will interrogate you, investigate, will question you basically to get out material facts to get out evidence yeah so you have the right to keep quiet that includes whether you have the right to you see this narco analysis and uh, polygraph test etc there is a case called selby versus state of karnataka wherein it was said that without the consent of the person these kind of tests cannot be conducted lie detecting test to know if this person is telling lies whether he committed the offense, etc. If the, per, the uh, accused does not consent to these kind of tests, this cannot be con conducted on you. Right to be examined by a doctor. As earlier said, uh, the accused has a right to be examined by a doctor and it should be a lady practitioner. Now, taking 
health care and safety that is a responsibility of the police officers if you are arrested and you are detained in the prison your health is the responsibility of the police officers this is to ensure that you are not tortured there is no barbaric torture or inhuman treatment which is done against you now the principle of natural justice has to be applied what is this principle of natural justice basically if you are accused in a case if they say you did an offense your part should be heard similarly the judge should be impartial suppose there is a fight between you and me and my uncle is the judge obviously my uncle will rule in favor of me right so judge should be impartial and not biased for that they say no one should be judge in his own case so because it is my case my relatives my near and dear one should not be the judge that is also very important yes right to notice the police will send now you have to come here to this particular police station report at this police station on 20th evening at 5 pm for a discussion or for a talk whatever all those things you have you need to have the notice okay now arrest will be done by physically touching the body the normal procedure for arresting is basically uh, we cannot say stay five feet apart and say you are under arrest basically they have to be uh, the police has to touch the body of the offender that is it but for women uh, it should be the women police officer and if you really don't like somebody touching you you can say that unless in extreme suppose uh, you are very notorious they cannot permit that you have to be uh, you know caught by hand and taken only in those situations women need be taken otherwise uh, you need not be touched if you do not like even a woman touching you you are respected now let me tell you one more thing handcuffing you would have seen that right police taking the criminal there is one chain in his hand handcuff in his hand now there is a general rule that normally people should not be handcuffed only if the criminal is so notorious that he will try to escape from the judicial system from the police only then should handcuffing be used handcuffing should use at the rarest very mild incidents so if you are unnecessarily handcuffed you can always fight against it especially the yes uh, similarly the, there is no police just simply takes you inside the police station and keeps you there officially in their records you are not arrested that cannot be there should be an official arrest which is registered then only can you be arrested similarly if a police officer is coming for investigation to your house especially the places where women are living they need to be their designation uh, proof as well as their name badge etc they are stars whatever all those things should be there to know who is that similarly when you are being arrested you have the right to inform your relatives that is somebody is arresting you police is arresting you you can intimate your nearest neighbor you can uh, you have the right to call and inform your family etc so the right of your family to know the uh, that you are arrested is also there okay now if you want you are arrested and taken and you want somebody to accompany you you can always take somebody outside the police station and have them waiting there for you all those things police should inform about your arrest to their higher authorities now also you have the right suppose you are wrongfully arrested you have the right to claim compensation for your wrongful arrest so that is said in uh, section 60 and 358 of the crpc suppose you sorry uh, actually i wrongfully arrested you i didn't know uh, or it was a mistake you say no uh, you're sorry i mistook you for somebody else etc all those situations you can claim compensation 
you can file case. Now, a right to appeal, right to bail, right against solitary confinement. Now, what is a solitary confinement? In very serious offenses, uh, you see that, you will see in movies, right? A very big, big notorious criminals are put in one single uh, cell, which is very dark and only they will be there in that cell. Nobody else. They are not uh, let out for food or uh, recreation with others. So that is basically uh, solitary confinement is. You are solitarily confined in the cell. So, you have the right not to be solitary confined. And. Uh, even if a person is given solitary confinement, it cannot be like uh, in a month, uh, six, seven days is only permissible. So there are some uh, restrictions for solitary confinement. Now, in normal scenario, you don't need all those things. So, I'm not going into uh, much depth. Yes. Now, uh, exclusive right of women accused. That is not said in the Code of criminal procedure, but basically the jail manual, the prisons act, etc. Right of prisoners, etc. Now you will not you should you have the right not to be discriminated on the basis of your sex in the jail or uh, because you are a woman from a lower community, etc. Now, if you take a look, statistics basically, uh, I don't know if it's there is an intention intentional game behind it or whether it is mere coincidence. But if you take a statistics, if you look into the newspapers, you can see that. Usually people from the. Backward community, the number of. Accused or number of people accused in cases, number of people in jail, number of people who are convicted are more. Now, don't tell me the people from backward community are all very bad. No. There is also a power politics which happens in the background. As said, there is law, but also there is a lack in it. Yes. So, uh, Prem Shankar, these are some of the rights that women uh, hand. Women prisoners, some case laws which have emphasized about the right of women who are in the prison. One is the first one is against handcuffing. The second one is against uh, inhuman barbaric treatment. Now, this DK Basu case laid down like just like how Rajim Ma'am said about Vishaka. DK Basu said about uh, uh, wide guidelines that should be followed when a person is arrested, when a person is detained, etc. So, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment should not be permissible. You know that, right? All that if you watch the if, those who watched movies need not uh, be told about what all kind of third degree measures are resorted to. Now, well, my dear friends, the police system and the judiciary are not exactly like what you see uh, in the TVs. There is a lot of difference, but just to know the real, uh, you know, the bad side of everything. Yes, we always refer to the movies. Yeah, Sheila Barse. Now, this is constitutional right of women prisoners have to be protected, etc. Now, uh, usually, usually pregnant women are not sent to prisons. Only in very rare cases. And even if a child is born, the child uh, has to, like, nurse should be given, the mother and the child should be given facilities for nursing the child, etc. And the general presumption is that in normal cases that the child was born outside the prison. prison. So, only in rare cases should the uh, child. I mean, should the pregnant woman be arrested? Now, you do you know the case of a pregnant woman who was arrested in Rajiv Gandhi assassination case that Nalini was pregnant when she was arrested? Yes, 1st information report. Now, this is about the right of a victim. Now, what is this FIR? FIR should be registered. Now, you are a victim. Somebody committed an offense against you and you go to the police station. You give your statement. Sometimes you give, you write a big complaint and you go and give it to the police. Now, they, they will say like, oh, you come on so and so day. Uh, please listen. Please listen. Uh, play, pay attention because usually what happens is like we go and give a complaint to the police station. The police say, say okay, you go and come. You have a right to get a receipt. Only if the police gives you a receipt will your case be 
taken into record. There are so many cases, so many people who go and give complaints. Uh, police will usually not look into everything because there is a space stage of the attack. Or maybe there is also a thing called as bribery from the other party for not taking this case into record. So, what are the options that is available for you? You de definitely have the right to ascertain that they give you this particular slip that they have acknowledged your complaint. And if they say today the system is not working, today we can't type and give you. Please ask them to manually write and give you and sign it. Or if they say the next day, go the next day. Collect, ensure that you collect the slip. Only then your complaint would be into record. Now, suppose the police officer is still very adamant. Along with the copy of your earlier complaint, you can file it to the circle inspector, to the SP, or you can even go to the assistant commissioner along with the copy of this. Now, along, even if this is not taken into record and your, the system is very biased towards you, you can directly go into court with the help of a judge and file your complaint. Fine. Now, what is this first information report? This is basically the first information you give about a offense. So, basically, if you are a woman who is giving a statement, your statement should be recorded by the women police officer. They can come to your place. Now, even if they say like something happened like this, FIR can be recorded at the place where you're comfortable. With regard to children, it is very important to note that child should not be detained uh, in the police station in the night. Similarly, if it's a child, the FIR should be recorded by a sub-inspector. And while dealing with children, the police should not be in uniform. Okay. Now, zero FIR. I said about FIR, right? FIR is usually we go to our police station. When something happens, we go to our nearest police station. But suppose an offense has been committed against you and for your safety, you ran away from the place where you are. You went to some other district some other far off place. The moment you reach there, you can go to the nearest police station, the nearest police station and file a complaint. Now you will ask me if something happened in uh, Trichy, how can I go to Coimbatore and file a complaint? You can. This is known as zero FIR. That new police station, that means basically the place where you go to, that, that police station will not put a case number for your listing because it is not in their jurisdiction but they will put some a name, zero number for that and they will start with the investigation and then they will forward this to you. Now, why they will start with the investigation? Suppose you're a rape victim or you're a, a victim of a sexual abuse or something like that or somebody stabbed you, whatever. The reason why the zero FIR is taken is that the investigation should start fast because see, now there will be some evidence in your body, suppose somebody stabbed you, you have a wound which needs to be examined or somebody raped you. There will be this uh, evidence of rape, the male, uh, something, some hair of his or maybe like some, uh, the reproductive uh, evidence, whatever. So all those things need to be timely taken. You need to be timely, uh, this thing, timely intervened in. So that is the reason why the, you, of zero, uh, I mean, zero FIR. You go and file an FIR and the next thing, maybe if you need to be medically examined, etc., they will start with the investigation. They will forward you to the medical panel, etc. So that is a reason for this zero FIR. So basically something happened and you don't have the time to go and file in your police station. You have to run for your life. Wherever you run to, you can go to that police station and file a case. You can give a FIR. Now, uh, Cognizable, bailable, all these kind of offenses. Uh, usually, see, uh, yeah. People always, you come across all these kind of things in the newspaper. This is a cognizable offense. This is, a, is this a bailable offense, etc. Basically, uh, 
non cognizable offense is a less serious offense like cheating assault etc <coughs> so in such cases only fir is usually taken into but in serious cases that is like a uh, murder rape theft if the police does not accept your complaint what can you do you can directly file a complaint before the magistrate also now i forgot to tell you one more thing earlier now you filed all these uh, cases you gave the fir to the police police does not did not accept it and if you have evidence for the same you can file a case against that particular police officer you can file a criminal miscellaneous petition against that particular police officer similarly uh, it is very specifically mentioned in the indian penal code that any public officer who refuses to re uh, register the fir they can be punished so basically what when you hear cognizable etc means it's a serious offense when you hear non cognizable it is a less serious offense that is what it means yes the victim has the right to compensation now uh, there are three provisions for compensation one is the pro compensation from the part of accused accused has to pay the compensation uh, for example like for meeting the court expenses the petitioners court expenses or uh, suppose the victim has suffered injury uh, the accused should give money for that etc now there is one provision known as 357a please note 357a 357a is the duty of the state or the government to compensate when does this come suppose the compensation which is given in 357 is not adequate or suppose somebody did something to you you are a victim and but who did it is not traceable somebody threw acid on your face but you don't know who did it now the accused is not traceable but basically you need justice you need immediate medical treatment you need rehabilitation for that all for all those purposes this 357a comes now how do you how can you ask how can you uh, know if you need compensation where to approach you can go to your district legal service authority which is attached to the court basically your court complex there will be something known as a district legal service authority where you can go and apply for and there is a big mechanism which uh, will uh, find out if you are in needy and if they recommend etc then there is a fund which is maintained by the government victim compensation fund for every state it has so from that fund you will be compensated now in uh, now 357b's uh, in cases of acid attack etc uh, along with the compensation which is said in those sections this compensation can also be given additionally yes now as a victim what right do you have at investigation stage suppose the police has uh, investigated and there are two see one is you gave your complaint they didn't accept it next is they took they looked into your complaint and they said there is a, basically there is no such thing he did not do such things you are spelling wrong then you have the right to approach the magistrate and challenge the closure report of the police they closed this investigation but basically uh, i am at great peril because of that you can definitely say yes this is the section which punishes the public servant for not this thing the uh, fir now you have right to appeal i'm telling about the right to appeal of the victim not the offender now this right to it suppose you are a victim and the person who did wrong to you is acquitted what do you mean by acquitted he is not punished he is left free court said he is not guilty court left him then you can appeal the next is he is suppose he raped me but the punishment which is given is for sexual assault then i can challenge it then 
for similarly for inadequate compensation the compensation which the lower court awarded is not adequate but remember you cannot appeal for giving greater sentence suppose the criminal got only life imprisonment the court did not order to hang him to death you cannot go and say respected court you should order that man man is hanged to death the victim does not have the right it is the state in criminal cases that goes for enhancing that is the government of suppose a crime happened in tamil nadu it is the uh, state of tamil nadu which has to go uh, challenging this that means the prosecution has to challenge the lesser punishment and file for enhanced public case for enhanced punishment okay now if you uh, suppose now i told you like suppose i am uh, i am the victim and the criminal has been left free i i want to file a case i cannot directly file a case i have to take the permission of the high court and then only file a case ccc that criminal who did this to me is left free i cannot directly go and file a case i have to take permission from the high court and then only file a case in case the accused is left free now when uh, victims role in trial what is the victim in trial in criminal cases now you understand one thing there is a very big difference in civil case and criminal case criminal case the crime is taken to be an offense against the state so am i audible are you hearing are you all there i can't see your messages somebody just revert back ah uh, okay fine yeah see what is the role of the victim in trial the role of victims in trial the victim uh as said see now there are two types of complaints one is two types of cases one is civil case in usually your property matter or something like that you go and the second is crime so the crime is basically taken to be an offense against the society at large so in a crime it is usually even though suppose i am raped i am not the petitioner there or i am not the one who takes the case forward instead of me it is the state which stands in my feet so that is where the prosecution public prosecution the state lawyer will be fighting the case so in these kind of offenses the victim has no role usually the case suppose now it is a rape case rape and murder uh, it is a murder case you see usually the public prosecution the prosecution is very strong and all that you will read in the paper uh, or you will see in the tv whatever so the role of the victim there is merely a spectator or maybe a witness i am raped i do not have the right to keep my lawyer and see that the accused is punished what then can i do i can appoint my lawyer who can help the prosecution and also ensure that my compensation is given or my rights are taken into accord but my lawyer can uh, also give a statement of my plight only after the evidence is recorded evidence is recorded means after the examination cross examination etc similarly definitely my lawyer or the victim's lawyer does not have the right to uh, like cross examine the witnesses ask question to the accused etc so this basically a victim is merely a prosecution victim prosecution witness yes now uh, when i was talking to you i was saying about accused and acquittal and conviction and all different terms now let me tell you uh, one of the greater greatest right if you are accused of an offense accused means basically what do you say you are accused there is an accusation against you so it does not mean that you did it so there is a presumption of innocence until you are proved guilty so that is a right of a if you are accused of a crime that does not mean that society cannot judge you just because you are accused of a crime that you did it or cannot uh, like stigmatize you that you are that of a criminal even if 
you did the offense everything is based on the evidence which is laid before the court which the court appreciates based on that it is decided whether to acquit you acquit you means to set you free to convict you means punish you well yes the topic itself is women and constitution so from where does all these special laws that you and me have come from there is special reservation for women there are special provisions for women um ladies first yes and different acts like say child marriage prohibition act then you have uh, uh in like in immoral like what do you say different acts for the protection of women domestic violence act dowry prohibition act which advocate reggie took the previous day so from where does this all get the power all these acts has its source in the constitution now the preamble of the indian constitution itself the preamble is basically uh, what do you say an eye opener to the constitution or you can say it is just it is the gist of the core principles which is embodied in the constitution so all these principles which are stated here in different different forms you can find it in different different provisions or different different articles of the constitution so the preamble itself says that there should be equality of status and opportunity so equality of status and opportunity for all so equality for women okay now when we say about the constitution i would first want to say article 14 article 14 says about equality before law article 14 says that there should be equality everyone should be equal before the law but you will be asking me if everyone is equal why special laws for women why are you classifying these uh, women into different from men why are you giving special preference for women why are you giving special preference for uh scst why so the aim of law is to make everyone equal so there should be an equitable distribution so that is what happens through these reservations so that tomorrow they all come everyone comes in the same status now i will give you an example why uh if you have a ration card from the government you would find that the different classifications now if you really come from an affluent background you would be getting only less ration those with a lesser i mean those from a poorer background will be getting more ration from the government more facilities from the government by so if everyone is equal before the law it is to ensure that tomorrow everyone is equal or is to ensure that by giving them that extra support they come balance with others come in balance with others so it doesn't mean that women is weak and man is strong yes everyone is different it's just that by nature physically women are weak or socially because of the social conditions uh, women are always suppressed be it in any profession even if you are students or if your faculties who are working in distinguished institutions you yourself would have untold stories of suppression you would be smiling in your like mind but yes reluctant to speak out that is the real scenario so basically article 14 says that you can classify people into different classes that is okay if you have a object to achieve so that is okay why if i classify all you girls together with an aim to achieve that is okay that is permissible now i can classify uh, from the same same category some preferential treatment to some is not permissible but people of the same kind can be given preferential treatment to ensure that they are in equal par with others so basically it is just this we are looking across a wall we have height and a baby also wants to look across the wall what do we do to ensure that 
way we can we we'll put a stool and give so that she also can stand in our height and see that's it giving an extra support now article 15 when we say about article 15 article 15 says that nobody should be discriminated on the ground of religion race caste sex place of birth note sex so article 15 clause 1 of the constitution says that you should not be discriminated on the ground of sex now Article 15, Clause 3 says about the special enactments. State can make special provisions for women and children. That is how you see the special provisions added into various laws, special acts like the Dowry Prohibition Act, Domestic Violence Act, and the various laws which have come for upliftment of women. All this gets their source from Article 15. Now, Article 16 says about public employment, that is into governmental jobs. Every citizen should have the equal opportunity irrespective of their sex also. I'm not going into detail explaining the provision, etc. Because that is immaterial for you, that doesn't matter. All that you need to know is that in public employment, irrespective of your sex, you have right to equal opportunity. There shall be equality of opportunity, equal access to all to public employment, irrespective of your sex. Okay. Article 60. Irrespective of whether you're Hindu, Muslim women, irrespective of your women or man, irrespective of whether you're a SCST women or SCST, you're a Bengali, Bihari, Tamilian, Malayali, whatever. Yes. Fundamental duties. Now, in the fundamental duties, we all would have learned this from our school age itself, fundamental duties. Now, in the fundamental duties, which is, there is a special uh, section which says, special provision, special area, which says that practices which are derogatory to women should be denounced, should not be taken up. So, the dignity of women should be uplifted. It is a fundamental duty of all. Now, we also have provisions for trafficking of human beings, which is trafficking of women, especially in, uh, yeah, I will come to that. Now, when it comes to direct principles of state policy, again, what is direct principles of state policy? See, there are certain provisions in the constitution which are direct for the government. That is, not necessary that uh, as a must the government should implement this but subject to the financial capacity the government has to keep all these ideas in their schemes for example right to education yes they have to ensure that right to education is kept uh, good nutrition yes they have to ensure that good nutrition is given to children to uh, expecting mothers etc so these are just guidelines as to how the government should keep the things going. So directive principles are basically directions for the government to follow. In the directive principles, etc., uh, it is said in Article 39, Clause A, that men and women have equally the right, should have the means to livelihood equally. Similarly, equal pay for both men and women is also emphasized in Article 39, Clause D. Now, when it comes to reservation of suites for women in Panjayat and municipalities, now you know one third of total seats and in Panjayat and municipalities should be women. Now, uh, one third of total members of officers should. Uh, uh, for the seat, even the chair seat for the, there should there should be one third reservation uh, in municipalities and the panjayat. Similarly, for the uh, chairperson of the panjayat also. Now, uh, even in SCSTs, when it comes to the seat for SCSTs in panjayat and municipalities, in that also there should be specific reservation for members of SCST community who are women. Now, human trafficking, Article 23. What is human trafficking? Human trafficking is basically, uh, 
taking people now you see like a train i'll give you an example there is a particular railway station in kerala where you see a lot of people a lot of women and boys and girls coming down from north india and getting down and all these people are taken into various industries for example uh, they are taken into the massage parlor they are taken for child labor etc so basically transporting persons for um uh, doing or making them do uh for exploitation so uh that is human trafficking so human trafficking is to an extent uh to an extent trying to be curbed but not curbed but there is an express provision which says that human trafficking is to be prevented that is article 23 now when we say about immoral trafficking act 2013 again girls are trafficked for prostitution for massage parlors etc trafficking as a whole should be avoided traffic kidnap uh, trafficking for uh, what do you say for kidnapping and uh, kidnapping for traffic sorry kidnapping of minors or women for trafficking uh, there are express provisions in the indian penal code which says that all these are to be punished with severe punishment similarly there are various other provisions in the constitution like article 20 uh, article 19 says about the right to speech and expression and the right to travel freely right to choose occupation uh, right to reside etc all these are available to men and women irrespective of your gender it is available to all it is irrespective of whether you are a man woman or you are a third gender yes so these are some of the constitutional provisions now when it comes to property rights of women as earlier said now i i mentioned a case uh where in a women can now be co-partners what does this co-partner mean basically co-partner is a uh, you know a uh, mem members of the family who obtain the right over ancestral property by virtue of birth basically it is the uh, old that is uh the ancestor plus three generations who are born who will be the co-partners now i'm telling you this to understand like whether women will be taken as co-partners that is the question when it comes to hindu law that is basically whether women have the right to property that is the question now earlier women could not be co-partners but by the hindu succession amendment act 2005 there has been few changes which has come women can be co-partners even now you are married and sent off also you can be co-partners to your family property so just like how the males have you also have the joint ownership over your property now the question is vinita sharma versus rakesh sharma in this particular case vinita sharma versus rakesh sharma cleared a big question earlier see this amendment came only in the year 2005 so they said women have the right to co-partners etc so now the question was uh, only whether women only those women whose fathers were alive when this 2005 amendment came whether only they have this right to co-partnership or whether uh, whose fathers died before this 2005 whether they also have this right to co to be the co-partner this was the question and through various case laws uh, different opinions have been expressed and finally in the year 2020 2020 it was said that women achieve this right by virtue of their birth irrespective of whether their father was alive in 2005 or no every woman by virtue of their birth they get this right it's not necessary that their father should have been uh living at this time so this is a major judgment which cleared the doubt so women are now co-partners to property now what is the property right of mother 
now you see that uh, I'm not going to explain it in detail, but yes, uh, in personal laws, uh, for the sake of property, etc., people are divided into different classes. So the mother, son, sister, mother, son, daughter, etc., they come in class one. So because mother is in class one, yes, she has right to her property of her predecessor. son. If the son dies, the mother has right over the property. Similarly, sister. Sister comes in class two. So sister will have only right when class one members, like say example, the wife or the son or the mother, etc., are not there. Only in that circumstance will the class two legal heir, that is the sister, have the right. Now, when it comes to wife, can a wife have share over her husband's property as per Hindu law? Yes, definitely. She will have right to her husband's property. Not only that, even if she's a widow who is not remarried, she will also have a share over her uh, deceased husband's property. Now, uh, let me tell you, if a living wife, a legally married living wife exists and the husband marries a second one, has a living relationship with the second lady, whatever, can she be entitled to property? No. So long as the first marriage is valid, the second wife is not entitled to property. Now, just for your information, suppose there are girl children or there are children basically. In the second marriage, those children are taken, are eligible to the property of the father, but definitely not their mother because she is the second wife where the uh, original, I mean the first legally wedded wife is living. Now, with, when it comes to Christian women to get share in property, I would like to state the uh, name of Sri Mary Roy was a state of Kerala. This Mary Roy is the mother of the famous writer Arundhati Roy. Now, in this case, it was said that women have right to succession in demise father's property, irrespective of whether you're married or whether you're not married, etc. Daughters have right in the deceased father's property. Now, wife, so what is the share of the wife in the husband's property? The wife will have one third share and remaining two third will be distributed among the children. And if no children, then wife will get half of the share in the property and half will be distributed to maybe the parents of the deceased, etc. And if no other near relatives, then the whole property will be distributed to the wife. Now, if it comes uh, to the now, I'm talking about the scenario where the will is not made. Uh, did you get it? See, suppose now I am go I, uh, I wrote a will that my property will go to so-and-so person and I died. Then there is no question. I'm talking about the situation where the will is not made, where the person before dying has not written and kept that this my property should be divided like this. In that situation, how will the property be divided? Uh, what is the share? Uh, do the, does the wife or does the mother have right? That is what is being discussed here. Muslim women. Now, when, when you speak about Muslim women, uh, yes, the Muslim uh, wife has right. If the if there is a child, then children, then one eighth prop share in the property will go to the wife. If no children, then one by fourth will go to the wife. If there are more than one wife, because as per Muslim law, uh, four wives are permissible. 1 by 16 share in the property. Okay. Now, adoption rights in India. What are the adoption rights of women in India? Let me tell you, uh, as per Hindu law, a man can adopt, an unmarried or a divorced woman can adopt. But if you are a married woman, you need to get the consent of your husband. Without the consent of your husband, you cannot adopt. Same is the case with Christian extra now no sorry when it comes to christian adoption is not recognized even in muslim adoption is not recognized how the adoption goes ab about will i will mention to you now now here as i said the uh, married women need the consent of the husband now uh, without the consent of the husband they can adopt in situations like the husband has denounced the world that is he's gone into sannyasam or he has lost his mental capacity. 
irrevocably. In all those situations, the wife can go without the consent of the husband. In all other situations, husband has to, uh, I mean, it is a husband who can take in, uh, into decision as to whether adoption, adopt or no. So the consent of both husband and wife is very essential. So adoption basically goes like the husband uh, adopts with the consent of the wife. Now the consent of the wife need not be taken in situations like uh, she has denounced the world, she has ceased to be a Hindu, um, she has she is of unsound mind, etc. Now, uh, in Christians and Muslims, basically adoption is not recognized, but guardianship is recognized. Now, I can be a guardian to a minor, and uh, but the, that is never like adoption. See, in adoption, the child becomes totally yours. In guardianship, you lose control of guardianship over the child when the child becomes 21 years old. For guardianship act, the age of the child to be major is taken as 21 years. Yeah. So now how does adoption happen now? It happens under the Juvenile Justice Act, which has been amended in 2015. So the agency which is responsible is Central Adoption Resource Authority. This is the agency which uh, facilitates adoption now in our country, both inter inside the country and inter country. Who can be adopted? That is a question. Who can adopt is also a question. Up to 18 years, anybody, that is even girl child can be adopted. Now, the Juvenile Justice Act says about two kinds of children. One is juvenile offenders. Basically, I forgot to tell you, if you are a child, offender under 18 you commit an offense you are not tried under the normal law you're tried under juvenile justice law that is all this ipc all that will i mean all the crpc things what we learned will not be applicable you will be treated very differently in a very child friendly manner but one thing is to be understood like after the nirbhaya case for brutal offenses if you are above 16 years of age then you will be taken as an adult this is just an information now as per section 56, couple or a single parent can adopt. Often abandoned or surrendered child. Yes, I was going to tell you there are two categories of children as per this act. One is juvenile in conflict with law, that is child offenders. The second is juvenile in need, child in need of care and of uh, protection. That is the first one is like say the child offenders after they finish their uh, punishment or after they finish their, that reformation period, they can be put out for adoption if they don't have parents or whatever. The second is child, uh, orphan children, that is abandoned children. They, that is, those are the children who are in need of care and protection. So these two categories can be put out for adoption. Same way adoption, uh, so this act also says that uh, adoption within relatives also is permissible. So that is with regard to uh, uh, who can be adopted. Now, who can adopt? That is a question. A female and a male can adopt. So women also can adopt. Phys uh, physical fitness, mental fitness should be there. And if it's a couple, both husband and wife has to consent. If it's a divorced person or a single person, they can adopt. There is no restriction. But a female child cannot be given to a male. Note, a female child cannot be given in adoption to a male. Now, we are women. That is not our right, but definitely we are women. And, and it's the right of a girl child. So, we need to know. Yes, two and a half years stable, uh, two years stable relation, marital relationship is necessary for adoption. The age difference between the child and the prospect to adopt to parents should not be less than 25 years. So there should be an age gap of 25 years between the child and the parents. Similarly, with two more than three children, uh, usually adoption is not permissible. Yes. Now, when it comes to guardianship, who is the natural guardian of, or who are guardians? As per Hindu Marriage Act, 
mother, father, husband, and natural guardians. Usually the guardianship is with, even though the custody of the minor child is usually with the mother, the guardian is usually taken to be the father. Now, with regard to illegitimate children, it is the mother who is the guardian. It, who is the uh, children who are illegitimately born. Now, adoptive children's case also, it is the adoptive father who is the guardian and in his death, it will be the adoptive mother. Now, what is the status of guardianship under Muslim law? Under Muslim law, uh, only father is considered to be the natural guardian of legitimate children. In, uh, now, in Muslim, there are two sections. One is Sunni and one is Shia. As for Sunni, they say that after the father, the grandfather. Okay. And if the grandfather is not there uh, to be executed, the father has written a will, like this person will execute my will, etc. And that person will be the uh, uh, like person who will take care of the property of my child, etc. Then that person. Now, uh, otherwise, it is the father, in the absence of father, the grandfather. Now, Christians usually do not, uh, Christians are followed by the uh, Guardians and Wards Act. So here, guardianship, this is very much uh, a secular section. Basically, while considering the guardianship, the, the age, religion of the minor, character, capacity of the guardian, etc. will be taken into. Uh, this is for the sake of like your, uh, your, in the absence of parents, you are appointing another guardian, etc. That this is the <coughs> scenario. <coughs> Usually, it's the father and the father. <coughs> okay. Now, I'm coming to matrimonial religion. The grounds of divorce. This first one I'm talking about, the Hindu Marriage Act 1955. That is divorce grounds for Hindus. So, who all comes under Hindu? Even Buddhist Jain or Sikh by religion will come, <laughs> excuse me, as Hindus. Muslim, Christians, Parsis, or Jews will not come under the purview of Hindus. <coughs> what are the grounds for divorce? Usually, uh, adulterous relationship with another. Remember, I told you adultery is no longer an offense. Right? Yes, adultery is no longer an offense, but it is a ground for divorce. Your spouse has an extramarital relationship. That's a ground for you to divorce your spouse. <coughs> then cruelty. If the spouse has deserted you, that the house has stopped living with you for the past two years and going and living with his uh, parents, whatever. Converted to other religion, unsound mind, important, importancy is another ground for divorce. Venereal diseases, communicable diseases, if the spouse is suffering. If that person has uh, renounced the world, that is like uh, sannyasam. And uh, remember, if a person is not heard of for seven years. Now I went missing and I'm not hurt for seven years. Then that's the ground for my spouse to enter into another marriage. <coughs> Similarly, you can, uh, my spouse had another living wife or husband at that time. The wife exclusive, the husband has been guilty of rape, bestiality or sodomy. Now, bestiality and sodomy are unnatural offenses. Uh, rape, you know. And uh, suppose there is a maintenance case between the husband and wife and the court has ruled in favor of the wife. The husband has failed to give this maintenance for a period of one year or more. Then definitely that's a ground for divorce. Now, if the wife was below 15 years age when she was married, now, irrespective of whether there was a sexual relationship, that is, consummation of marriage means whether they sexual, they were in a sexual relationship. 
this wife can repudiate the marriage on attaining majority. Now, the law is against 15 years of marriage, but personal laws of Muslims, etc. Puberty is at 15 years. So, yes. Now, divorce by mutual consent is also permissible under Muslim, under Hindu law. Now, when it comes to Muslim law, uh, is I have some quite interesting things to talk to you, especially that triple talaq, which has been declared unconstitutional. Now, uh, the dissolution of Muslim Marriage Act 1939. <coughs> As for this act, this act only women have this. These are the grounds for the wife to divorce. That is, your husband has been known for not known for four years. Note Hindu act we said. Uh, Hindu's case, we said seven years. Here it is four years. Husband has not provided maintenance for two years. Earlier it was one year there. Her husband has been sentenced to imprisonment for seven years. Husband has failed to uh, perform his marital obligation for three years. That is, they have not been living as husband and wife together for three years. Husband is important. He has been ins insane. That is, uh, he has lost his mental capacity. He has treated with cruelty. Then, uh, before she was the age of 15, she has been given into marriage. He leads an immoral life. Similarly, she is not able to observe her religion. Um, she, is dis she is dispossessed of her property by her husband and she is not able to exercise her rights over it. <coughs> if he has more than one wife, he is not treating each wife equally. These are the grounds in Muslim law. Now, when it comes to men, the options for Muslim men is talaq. Usually, they pronounce talaq and the divorce comes. Divorce happens. Now, uh, oh, okay. usually talaq is possible. Oh, yeah. uh, different types of talaqs are there, definitely. Now, I want to talk to you about triple talaq. Okay, ma'am. I'll, I'll tell you how to... Now, triple talaq is basically in one pronouncement. See, uh, okay. These are the different types of talaq, uh, etc., yeah, which I don't need to go specifically. That she also want to what is triple talaq? Talaq is basically in one. Suppose now I tell you, I am the husband. I, 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 I am going to divorce you, divorce you, divorce you. Talaq, 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 or talaq, talaq, mut talaq. If I tell you directly in person, if I WhatsApp you, if I email you, uh, if I send a voice message, etc., wherever you are, the marriage is resolved. So basically, the problem with talakul bidat, that is irrevocable or triple talak. There is no gap also. In different other forms of talak, there are like three months gap is there. In each uh, month, you can say talak hasan and all is of that kind. But this is like in one stretch, you say three, three, and your marriage is dissolved. So the validity of this was challenged in Sayaro Bhanu versus Union of India. So and uh, th Triple talaq, tabal ul, ul biddad is unconstitutional, the court declared, and it is set aside. Based on that, after that, the Muslim Women's Protection of Rights on Marriage Act was passed. And now, they have protest against triple talaq. If the husband pronounces triple talaq, he will be imprisoned for three years. So, understand, for normally, in, uh, in normal, what did you understand? Normally for others, as per, as per other uh, family acts or other religious laws, it is just a civil. Your husband left you, it's a solution for you to claim maintenance or maybe to ask for divorce. But here it is an offense. He will be put under bars for three years. Similarly, wife has a say in the uh, bail of the husband, etc. Now, Christian uh, also somewhat the same, almost the same grounds. Women have exclusive grounds uh, when it comes to bestiality, sodomy, and rape, etc. <coughs> you know, when it comes to special marriage, act, this is applicable to two kinds of people. Secular marriage, people who have had secular marriage, not under any personal laws. Similarly, uh, for people who do register marriage. So, uh, special marriage act, or these are the grounds. That is imprisonment. Uh, for under Indian Penal Code, desertion for two years, cruelty, unsound mind, all those things. 
disability, venereal diseases, some other conditions are all same. Now, <clears throat> separate grounds for women, similar, same only, like rape, sodomy, okay, and a maintenance he has not paid, etc. So now, there's an option for divorce by mutual consent. I think uh, women should be knowing this. Uh, if husband and wife has lived together as husband and wife for one year, you can, uh, and you do not think your marriage will go on smoothly, there's an option to uh, go for mutual divorce. What is the benefit of this? And how is it different from the other? The other thing would go on for two or three years in the court because one party will allege and the other party defends. But here, if both the parties feel that it is irrevertibly broken and you, you cannot in any way patch up the relationship, then it is mutual, mutual divorce, which is usually granted in a period of six months. But now this is also possible to get in, get divorced in two or three months. You can waive the, you can put by putting a waive uh, petition to come to waive the six months period. If you think like, the marriage is totally broken down. There is no use of staying. <coughs> this is possible. Now you would be saying, uh, we are supposed to patch marriages. We, we are not supposed to be uh, bend or break marriages. Let me tell you, my dear friends, there has been a lot of incidents of in my state. I, I belong to the state of Kerala. There has been a lot of incidents of uh, brides committing suicide because they are in a suppressed relationship. They are in a very brutal relationship where harassment by the husband, by the in-laws, and they are not able to communicate to anybody. Nobody believes them or they are under pressure from their family because it's a shame what will people say, what will society say. We spend all our earnings on your marriage. Now you have to stay there, etc. That results in a dead daughter. So always a divorced daughter is better than a dead daughter. So I do not promote divorce, but if there are people in such situations, definitely life is more precious. Yes, nullity of marriages, marriage, now other, other remedies. You can nullify your marriage. You can nullify your marriage. That means you can go to court and say that the marriage was null. It was void. Basically, it was not at all a marriage in, in so, so, so and so situations. Parties do not have capacity, that is unsound mind, insane, minor, etc. <coughs> now, restitution of conjugal rights. I just want you to know what is this. Basically, uh, all the laws speak about restitution of conjugal rights. It is basically this. Your husband has been living away from you for some time. You can go and file this petition in the court asking your husband to come and live back with you. Now, it, is, uh, it was initially available only to the husband. That is, only the husband could go and file this. But now, even the wife can file this particular petition. Dear, uh, my husband is living away from me. I want him to come and start living back with me as husband and wife. This is restitution of conjugal rights. And court will pass this order. But do remember, everything else what the court passes is binding on the parties. They have to follow it. But this is discretionary. If the husband does not want to come and live with you, not necessary. And even after one year of passing this order, husband and wife have not started living as husband and wife, then it is also a ground for divorce. Now, judicial separation. This is not divorce, but temporarily court gives an order for both the parties to stay separately, to be separated for some time. The grounds for judicial separation are almost the same as that of divorce. So these are the matrimonial remedies, like uh, you can divorce, you can nullify your marriage, you can uh, judicial separate, you can go for restitution of conjugal rights based on your situations. That is now when it comes to maternity, uh, there was a maternity benefit act, but the law has been codified into the social security code. All the labor laws in the country have been come uh, kept under four umbrella codes. Now, when it comes to women's rights, earlier it was dealt under Maternity Benefit Act, Employee State Insurance Act, Employees Compensation Act, etc. dealt with the maternity relief, etc. But now all these have been codified under the Social Security Code. And there has there are different benefits for different sections. For biological mothers, that is if you are giving birth, 
you can choose whether it is uh, <coughs> the chapter which is relating to maternity benefits act or employee state insurances applicable to you now this benefit is um, uh, applicable to every institution which has more than 10 employees inclusive of factories mines plantations no not more than 10 women employees but more than 10 employees totally if there are 10 workers there this uh, law should be implemented now from uh, suppose i have delivered now it is a duty of the employer not to engage me to work within six weeks of my delivery now if uh, not only delivery if i underwent the termination or a miscarriage suppose my child was aborted naturally or i had to terminate my pregnancy due to uh, medical reasons etc then uh, then also the six weeks leave is applicable okay even if the woman chooses not to avail this leave, uh, she should be given benefit, like not to stand for long hours. Even pregnant women should be given the same. Now, maximum benefit available to women employed is 26 weeks. Maternity leave is 26 weeks. If one child. Now, if this is the second child, now you're giving birth to your second child, then the maximum period is 12 weeks with pay. Okay. So this 26 weeks is with pay in case you're having a first child and in case you're having your second child it is 12 weeks with pay okay now uh now if a woman was pregnant and she dies then to the day of till her death the benefits can be handed over to the family now after this uh during this period if she uh, avails work from home during the six uh, 26 weeks she avails work from home she can also be extended and given this work from home facilities. Okay. And uh, until the child is one and a half years old, she has to be given two nursing breaks a day. Now, now tubectomy. Now, uh, there are different kinds of uh, operations which, uh, uh, which happen uh, like gynec yeah i mean we will have to be uh, like what do you say that different types of uh, procedures are there like uh, maybe removing cysts from your ovaries or uh, surgery to your fallopian tube or whatever so for, in such cases also women have to be given two weeks uh, so leave okay now, if any illness arise uh, owing to your pregnancy, delivery, premature uh, um, birth, miscarriage, medical termination of pregnancy, etc., then additional one month with wages can be given. Despite all these things, uh, yeah. Similarly, a woman cannot be dismissed. A company is trying to reduce the number of workers. They cannot dismiss me when I am on maternity leave for whatever reasons. Okay. Unless and until I am accused of gross misconduct and I have been punished. Accused and punished. So basically I, uh, I took 1 lakh rupees from my office and I manipulated it or uh, I did, I bought grace. Uh, I did a lo lot of misconduct in my office, all those things. If that is those accusations are proved against me, then definitely uh, action can be taken. Otherwise, in my absence, I cannot be terminated during my maternity leave. Yes. Similarly, uh, within 48 hours of the date of delivery, the benefit uh, has to be given to the uh, lady. In order to check all these factors, there is an in inspector come facilitator who uh, looks whether uh, all these things, maternity benefits are given into, or if anyone has any complaints, etc. Now, if you are an adopting or commissioning mother, like for in the case of adoption, then you have 12 weeks from the date of adoption. Now, crash facility should be provided for mothers uh, with 50 or more employees, not women employees, 50 or more employees. If there are, then there should be crash 
uh, in that and four visits can be permissible for the bib. Now, the code on wages. This is again a code which has been codified. The uh, Equal Remuneration Act and the uh, Minimum Wages Act, etc., inter alia has been clubbed into the code on wages. And here also they say that for the same nature of work done by men and women, both are liable to equal rates of wage. No discrimination in wages, no discrimination on the ground of sex. Okay. Unless that particular thing is employed under uh, law. Now, suppose very hazardous occupations, women and children should not be engaged. If it's specifically said, uh, then women can be kept out. Otherwise, no discrimination to women and no discrimination on the uh, this thing. So, these are some of the codes which has been codified into the working conditions code. Now, this is applicable to industries with 10 or more workers. Similarly, if not 10 and more workers, two kind of, uh, this, this is applicable to two kind of industries. One is industries with 10 or more workers, or the second one is industries that uh, deal with hazardous or life-threatening nature of works, irrespective of whether there are 10 members or not. So basically, uh, they say that adequate washing facilities, separate washing facilities, separate restroom, separate locker, separate bathing, this thing, should be given to female and transgenders. Now, uh, similarly, earlier night shift was prohib prohibited under certain acts. Now that is removed and women with their consent, they can uh, be employed before 6 a.m. and after 7 p.m. So night shift is also permissible. Now, surrogacy. What is surrogacy? Basically, if the husband, or, uh, if the wife does not have a capacity to carry the child in her uterus, owing to medical reasons, or owing to uh, people do it for different reasons because they don't want their figure to go, whatever. So basically, uh, you're renting a, uh, what do you say that? A womb. That is surrogacy. Now, altruistic surrogacy is permissible in India. Earlier, commercial surrogacy, that is like you find a lady, you give her lakhs and lakhs of rupees for carrying your baby, that was there. Now, altruistic surrogacy is only permissible. That business of surrogacy is stopped in India. Now, uh, internationally, a lot of people used to come and the business of surrogacy was on a very large scale. But fortunately, unfortunately, this has uh, negatively impacted the life of many women who took this as a many women who were uneducated or but pretty or healthy. <coughs> they uh, found this as a means of subsistence for a means to get their daughters married, etc. But many of them have lost this, especially in the wake of COVID. Now, uh, do remember this, who can offer surrogacy? Now, married couple for at least five years, they only can offer surrogacy. Women should be 23 to 50 years of age, man 26 to 55. Now, remember, child, the couple should not have a child. That is, their own child, their biological child, or adopted child, or surrogate child living. Now, if they have a child, if a child is mentally weak or uh, mentally challenged or life-threatening disorder, fatal diseases, etc., if such a child is living, then okay, fine, they can go for another child through surrogacy. Otherwise, no. If you have even one living child who is your own adopted or surrogate, then you cannot go. Now, who can be close relatives of the couple? Now, who can be surrogate mother, close relative of the couple who uh, age 25 to 35? She can be surrogate only for once a lifetime and she has to be medically fit. So, basically, that game of money is not possible in India. Now, uh, there has been uh, Artificial Reproductive Technologies Act has been come up in 2021. With a lot of things like, for example, the sale of uh, uh, your embryos, the sale of uh, salmon, eggs, oocytes, etc., are stopped. So, commercialization is stopped. Similarly, uh, strict guidelines with regard to the confidentiality, informed consent, etc., of women uh, and men are taken into. And this is uh, applicable to uh, now. 
a single mother definitely can resort to uh, being a mother even if you're married you're divorced or you're single if you're married definitely you need the consent of your spouse now these are some of the international conventions we speak about the right of women and most of our indian law has taken uh, its birth from all these provisions and its clauses now i'm not going into detail uh, you can just look into this so basically trafficking political employment level health uh, economic and social life all that is dealt in all these things now icsr it basically says about fair conditions of work social security adequate food and clothing health education you can just look into the picture now <coughs> this is iccpr women should have civil and political rights now this is equal remuneration act 1976 that has been dealt under uh, the new code now discrimination should not happen on the basis of sex what is discrimination <coughs> Yes, irrespective of your marital status, men and uh, women should be treated equally. They're given, they should have the fundamental freedoms of political, economic, social, cultural, civil, etc. Yes, universal declaration of human rights. All human beings are born free. UDHR. Now, this is a basic document of human rights, and all uh, other human rights emerge from this. So, um, basically, Everyone is born free and equal in dignity and rights. So men and women are equal in dignity and right. Now this is Eve Teasing Act 2011. Eve Teasing, what, what is Eve Teasing? Eve Teasing is basically you uh, pass comments, vulgar statements, vulgar looks, all that will come under Eve Teasing. It will also attract those provisions uh, Reggie Ma'am has been updating you with yesterday. Okay, see now this is uh, obscenity. Uh, obscenity is basically uh, singing uh, obscene songs or words or by your play signs or whatever. If you are in public and you do this and you tease somebody, you will be punished. Uh, these are also some of the sections that the Ma'am dealt with yesterday. Now, female feticide. What is it? Yes, your baby inside the womb, gender is identified and the baby is killed. And female infanticide, after the baby is born, knowing it's a girl child, it is killed. Yes. So, uh, prenatal conception and prenatal diagnostics techniques act 1994 says that sex determination is an offense. If you go to any hospital and you see uh, outside the scanning room, you can see that sex determination is an offense. No one should ask, etc. All those things. So that is basically the because of the reason that the ratio of the girl child went down in the 1991 census. Census. So after that, any sex selection techniques misuse was to be taken as an offense. Yes. So. Uh, all the modern things, it has been amended in 2003 to bring ultrasound and uh, other technologies also within the purview of this act. Now, uh, <clears throat> it has to have a license for the purpose of conducting this, all those institutions, laboratories or clinics which conduct this. And anyone in no manner should communicate the sex of the child by signs, by words, whatever. Similarly, any person who puts the advertisement for prenatal preconception sex determination facilities, like notice wrapper, suppose somebody gives a notice or in some bottle wrapper, it is written that the sex of your child will be told if you come here, etc. All that is an offense which can go up to three years and fine. Now, uh, laboratories have to be compulsorily registered. Not only that, their registers have to be updated. If the uh, if the registries are not maintained properly, that carries equal punishment, just like sex determination. So it, it has put a, a very big responsibility on uh, to ensure that female infanticide and female feticide is prevented. Initially, 
people will uh, look and determine, understand the girl, it is a baby girl, and they will kill the child in the womb itself by uh, resorting to uh, unethical abortive practices. Because abortion law is strict or stringent, they will go to uh, unethical things, and that will result in uh, maternal death, death of the baby, death of the mother, etc. Now, the IPC, Indian Penal Code, says with regard to uh, offenses against unborn child. And it's possibly um, uh, in 99% cases, it's a girl baby. So, section 312 says voluntarily causing miscarriage. Uh, and if the mother also consents, now I, I am carrying a baby and I, I am pregnant, I am also consenting to kill my baby, to abort my baby, then uh, beyond the permissible limit, okay, beyond the permissible situations, etc. Uh, then I will be, uh, I can be given imprisonment for seven years. Section 313, without the women's consent, uh, the, whoever is doing this will be given uh, life imprisonment or uh, up to 10 years or five. Now, again, 314, causing mis while doing abortion, if the wife, if the woman dies, causing miscarriage, Resulting in death of women. That is like you see now, desire uh, some uh, green leaf or some unethical measures is resorted to, and then along with the baby, the mother also dies. Okay, now under section 312, uh, if now I told you uh, women consents, along with the women's consent, if abortion is done, uh, still women is punished. But she will not be punished in two situations. One, it is done in good faith. For if suppose now the fetus is identified to have some malignant deformalities. The second is uh, according to medical termination of pregnancy. Yeah. If it's a baby which is uh, uh, of rape or, uh, and if it's same uh, like incest. Incest is like suppose your family member rapes you and you're pregnant, etc. Now, uh, abandonment and exposure of infant. Now, after the baby is born, uh, up to 12 years, if you expose a child, same way concealing the birth of a child. Uh, now, the once the baby is born, you have to register the birth of the baby. Now, in order to ensure that the baby is not, uh, uh, like, the world does not know that this baby is born, you bury the baby, you dispose of the dead body, uh, and after burying, if the die, child dies, or even without uh, burying, I mean, the child dies and then you bury. Basically, if you don't, uh, if you kill the child by burying it, so that people outside world doesn't know, or you bury the child after the child is dead and does not inform the authority that such a dead child is born. I mean, such a child was uh, supposed to be born, but it died, etc. Now, uh, if you check with the birth registration criterion, you will find that the forms have like even if your baby is still born that is born while the baby is uh, i mean dead while the baby is born still you have to register it with the panjayat with the birth and death register, uh, department yes now medical termination of pregnancy act up till when is preg um, the termination of pregnancy possible in normal situations up to 20 years so you and me, if he does not want a baby, can simply go and terminate it. There is the necessity of approval by a medical practitioner. But one important thing to note is that if you are unmarried and you are pregnant, you can still access the facilities under this Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act. Because earlier, uh, people would resort to... Uh, you know, contraceptives, etc., and failure of contraceptives, and they would have to go to unethical means, which finally results in maternal death and all those things. So, uh, there is again a com lot of complications. Even if the mother survives, there will be a lot of complications to the mother for her prospective future uh, getting pregnant, etc. So, to avoid all those things, uh, ethically, uh, unmarried women have also been included by this latest amendment. Yes. No, usually, uh, Anisha, Anisha, ma'am? Yes. Uh, this is Regina. Actually, uh, you have to complete it the list, ma'am. Actually, time is 
uh, more than uh, the stipulated i think you consume okay i'm so, so sorry and i'm too blurred yeah yeah actually some uh, you have to stop yeah. it. you have to make it fast uh, and yeah, the other okay, other is waiting okay yeah i'll sum up in uh, in 5 minutes okay okay yeah so basically from 20 to 24 weeks uh, usually uh, the limit is 20 weeks but this limit by abortion can exceed up to 24 weeks in special circumstances example if you are a survivor of rape incest etc uh, now there was a case where beyond 25 weeks a father filed a case in kerala high court that the daughter was pregnant and it was 25 weeks and she was raped by a whole brother so in extreme circumstances beyond 25 weeks also it is a discretion of the court but uh, the legislature permits only up to 24 weeks okay in no way beyond 25 weeks so this is a difference which has happened in the 2021 amendment so beyond 24 weeks or up to up after up till 20 weeks you need the permission of one registered medical practitioner uh, after 20 that is 20 to 24 you need the approval of uh, a medical board itself now earlier <clears throat> women's confidentiality was important if that is broken only rupees 1000 rupees fine was given but now even one uh, year punishment imprisonment is given now women and disability now let me tell you my dear friends this is something uh, which we have to talk women are deprived of that women are deprived of this women are deprived of that then suddenly we see that yes uh, after so much of struggle the disabled have been able to find place in the reservation system or maybe uh, their rights are now being taken into consideration but let me ask you something in the disabled is there a special preference given to the disabled women if you go to any public space in most of the spaces in india you would find a board for example a board toilet disabled is there a different section for the disabled men and disabled women in most of the places you will not find it so though there is discrimination against women the plight of disabled women is very much on the and uh, <clears throat> now law says a lot about all those things and there is international recognition i will not want to say that but uh, yes children with benchmark disabilities are to be given free education up to 18 years note that similarly uh, 3% to 4% government jobs reservation will be there for people with benchmark disabilities and 3 to 5% in higher education system and also the uh, disability the number of uh, i mean the disability uh, waterfalls in disability has increased to 21 so and even now acid attack is also included in the context of disability so acid attack victim is also a uh, disabled person who will get the benefits of this act now special provisions with regard to women and children section 4 which says that uh, equal rights women and children will have equal rights with other disabled similarly reproductive rights person will uh, disability will have equal and uh, family plan will also be given if the if she understands okay so free and what a procedure she is uh, subjected to which are there for everyone who is this uh, uh, madam uh, sorry to interrupt Madam, please like share interrupt. the uh, uh, ppt uh, we'll upload the ppt anyways madam yeah. uh, under this also yeah. uh, women's yeah. flight has to be taken into consideration the uh, people with uh, women who are mentally uh, challenged have to be given special status because there are chances of they being uh, raped and uh, they being uh, sterilized compulsively uh, because they need, uh, there are chances of they being pregnant and outside world coming to know. There was a situation where I visited the uh, mental asylum in, near my place and I happened to see a lady completely naked in the cell. 
so the reason they and they were men attenders who are going the reason they said is like this woman she tries to commit suicide now what about the dignity even if she is mentally insane doesn't she have the dignity so uh where even normal people like us I have to anisha ma'am one is the rights of our disabled anisha ma'am you can uh, conclude ma'am you can share the ppt okay ma'am i'm i'm summing this up yes so my dear friends um, these are our rights summing up so every right will only be cherished if we uh, wish to take put it in spirit and not just keep it in letters so uh, i hope this is clear for you child marriage now uh, reji ma'am has said about uh, the age being increased to 21 years uh, uh, the parliament has taken it up and very soon it will be so uh, the thing is that child marriage is an offense which needs to be taken care of and in the uh, overshadowed by this covid scenario there is a lot of child marriage there are many girls who are given into child marriages which has to be taken very much care of i will be sharing the pdf with you and uh, it was great talking to you about all these topics and in case you have any doubt you are free to ask me thank you so much i will be sharing the ppt with you thank you uh, thank you so much ma'am so uh, to advocate is to add a voice of support to a cause or a person so uh, we wholeheartedly thank you for being the voice for the women fraternity and uh, thank you for sharing your valuable knowledge uh, thank you so much and have a good day and happy new year ma'am thank you thank you ma'am okay uh, ma'am we'll start the next session ma'am ma'am will be Netra, we will five minutes break, ma. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, let us start take a break. In five minutes. We'll start. Uh, now time is eleven thirty-five. Maybe we'll start by eleven forty, right? Okay, ma'am. Okay. okay.
Uh, dear participants, uh, there is some technical glitch uh, at the speaker's end. Uh, so uh, let us wait for a few more minutes until the speaker joins.